about refreshing your vision. I hope you read what I put on Facebook many times uh, on, our, on our Facebook page because I kind of give a, a summary or a, a preview of what's about to take place on Sundays a lot of times. usually try to do it by at least Thursday or Friday. But Paul had to write this letter in, in, in 2 Timothy, and that's where we're going to be focusing on. Paul had to write this second letter to Timothy to renew Timothy's vision for the church. Hey, life, is, life happens. Stuff happens in the church. Stuff happens in our, inside of our lives. And, and, and because things take place in our lives, sometimes we lose track of what God wants to do inside of our lives and inside of our church. We, we lose the passion of our vision. This whole month is about vision, and I'm hitting vision from a whole different, a lot of, a lot of different ways here. I want to try to hit it from every side, because we got to, that vision is something that we've got to have a, a grasp of, and passion is what drives that, that vision. And sometimes we, and, and some of us in here, some of you, maybe you've lost your passion for the things of God for this church. I don't know. I don't know where you are. I, this, is, this is the message that God has given me for this body today. And it's easy to do. The cares of life. Family situations arise. And they grab a hold of us and we, and we concentrate on them. We... we, we <coughs> We allow these situations to grab a hold of us, and through time, our vision and our passion for the things of God, or, or for the church, or for our family, we lose them. We lose that drive. We lose that passion. I'm here to tell you this morning that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the same. He never changes. You know who changes? We do. We change. That same power, that same resurrection power that, ro that raised Christ from the dead, it can dwell in you. That's a verse of scripture in the Bible. We made a song out of it. If that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, dwells in you, Mm. That same Holy Spirit, we need, a, we, need a, we need an outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon our lives. We need to find a refreshing, an anointing of the Holy Ghost upon us. That fire, that zeal for that passion, for the vision that God's placed inside of us. Say, well, Pastor, I've had a vision for this church. And at one time, I saw God just doing a lot of great things and this and that and whatever and, 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 and you know, the, the, the whole, the whole, the whole storyline there. But it's gone now. I don't, I don't have that drive anymore. I don't have that passion anymore. And I don't know what's wrong. I'm here to tell you, my friend, God never changes. There's people that have felt the call of God upon their life. God doesn't make a mistake. I don't care how many mistakes we make in life. But just because we've made mistakes in life does not change God's calling necessarily. It may change the route that we take to fulfill that calling. I've told people this over and over. They felt the call of God upon their life and then, then years later they, they we, we, you know, we... We, we meet up or whatever, and we look back at their life, and, and they did not go into the ministry or, or do what they were talking about, what they felt God leading them. Or, or maybe they were in ministry, and then, and then something happened, significant happened in their life, and it changed their life forever, and, and, uh, and, it, and it changed their ministry position. And they weren't doing what they once were called to do. God can restore. 
God can bring healing. And that vision and that passion that you once had for the things of God can come back. You see, because God never changes. We do. We allow life to change who we are. Paul wrote this second letter to renew Timothy's vision for the church. You might be looking at people in the Bible. Yes, people in the Bible that we highly esteem, that we look favorably on. They go through things in life. Timothy lost his passion. And you think, how could a person like Timothy, who hung around a person like Paul, who wrote over half of the New Testament, how could they lose their passion and their zeal for Christ? And we see here, Timothy was his vision for the church. He was, he, he, Paul had to write this to renew, to renew Timothy's passion and vision for the church. You know, it's, it's good to have a spiritual leader that you can call on, that you can, uh, that, and, th- and this, is, this a lot of times is what we need. A lot of times we try to tackle things on our own and we don't allow others to speak into, into our lives, but we need that. We need people to speak into our lives. It's okay to have an accountability partner. It's okay to have a mentor as long as that mentor is listening to God. Amen. Amen. You may never be a pastor of a church like Timothy, but if somewhere along the way discouragement finds its way to darken your vision for whatever you're, for whatever you're doing for the thing, for whatever you're doing for God, or, or whatever you're doing for your family, or for your country, or, 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 or th- this message right here, I believe, is for you. It's for you. So I want you to listen to it. I want you to grab a hold of it. You need to refresh your vision to rejuvenate your heart and your mind. God's purpose for the church is also relevant for the purpose of our lives. And we're going to read, we're going to look into in 2 Timothy and find out God's purpose for the church, what God expects from the church, and what God expects from us. And then we're going to let the fire of God and pray. That the fire of God rain downs upon, rains down upon us. You know, it's sad to be a part of something that's dynamic and something that's great and not have a fire for it, not have a passion for it. That's not what God, that's not what God desires of his church. God doesn't just desire us to run X amount of people so that we can have a, a good tithes and offering so that we can pay for the heating and cooling for the building and, and, and get new carpet for the church and pay the light bill and this and that and just go through the motions. That's not why we have church. If we're, if we're doing that, we're no better than any, any other civic organization. In the, in, in the, I mean, what, what's, what will separate the church from just any other sort of civic group? If, if that's all we did and we just met, there's a purpose that's deeper. And God, who, and God that, that, that the same God that created us into his image, created us for a deeper purpose, for a higher calling through the church. You know what the church is? The church is his mobile organization. It is his structured organization, his mobilized force. His army to defeat the gates of hell. That's what the church is. Ultimately, that's what it is. It's a mobilized force where a group of people can band together to bombard the gates of hell. And that's exactly, that's exactly what the church is. And we do that. We support one another. We hear one another. We grow with one another. We evangelize, we disciple, and we start one great big cycle. One by one. One by one. Some people, 
Some people and evangelists, they can do it and they can gather 10,000 together and thousands get saved. The church goes a step further than the evangelist does. Because, evangel uh, because churches need to disciple. We don't just need to maintain. Well, there's a lot of jobs in the church. You know that? There's a lot of things to do in the church. Man, not only do we have to, do we have to organize together and make decisions together, but, we, but, but spiritually we, we, need to, we need to reach the lost. That's always the purpose of a church. Okay, one of them. To reach the lost. But then you don't stop there because you've got to disciple those people. You don't just get them to, to accept, yeah, yeah, Jesus, uh, 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 you know, I want you as my Lord and Savior. And then, okay, all right, it's done. Great, you're one of us. Here, pick up this broom. <laughs> Man. We've got to disciple. We've got to plug them in. And disciple them. And that's the beginning stages of the cycle that we need to have in this church. Because eventually, we want them to be able to the place where we were of reaching someone and discipling them. Mm. So let's study God's word. I, I, I want to today, I want to encourage you to refresh your original vision for the church. To your original passion for the things of God. I, I, I want us to study these words of encouragement of, of Paul to Timothy. As, as Paul encouraged Timothy in his walk with God and, in, in, and for his vision. God has a vision for the church. So what type of vision should we have? So let's look at 2 Timothy. Starting with verse 3. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 3. And it says this. I thank God, whom I worship with pure conscience, in the spirit of my fathers, when without ceasing I remember you night and day in my prayers. We need a vision to give God glory in worship. Worship. That's one of the purposes of this church, is worship. Oh no, I'm not just talking about our music. It goes beyond. That, 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 that includes were, it, it, that's included in worship, but that's just one aspect of the worship that we ought to be having for God. <laughs> worship. Worship is more than just attending worship service, the AM service or the PM service. Worship is a way of life. It's how you conduct yourselves and, and behave, even in secret in the privacy of your own room. As Paul said, he said, I worship with a pure conscience. In other words... He knew that he wasn't hiding anything. He knew that he didn't have anything to be ashamed of. I worship with a pure conscience. Let me tell you something. You know, you, you, you know why? You know why a lot of times, oh, goodness, how do I say this without stepping on anybody's toes or without, without just, mm, my goodness, without just offending anybody, mm, should I be concerned about that? Mm, well, no, I'm not. You know something? So many times we try to do things for God, but yet we're so wrapped up in sin or the things that, 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 that pull us away. And I'm not talking about the occasional sin. Yes, we're going to sin. But there's a difference between an occasional sin and living in sin. There's a difference. There's a difference knowing that when you come down to the altars and you, and you give your life over to Christ or you make, you make things new, there's a difference in, in getting things right with God and turning over a new leaf and then there's a difference of getting things right with God and then knowing that when you walk out that door, you're going to run right back to it and living in it. We've got to be careful to not live in sin. 
You see, our, we got to present ourselves a living sacrifice according to Romans 12, 1 and 2. we got to present ourselves a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. So it's more than just coming to service. It's a way of life. Paul said, I worship with a pure conscience. I know that I'm not wrapped up in anything. I know that there's nothing. You know what happens a lot of times? We wonder why God's not moving the way that he needs to move. It's because we're not being what we need to be. We're wondering why God doesn't just take this church and do what, it, what he needs to do. Mm. Worship is the very reason why God created us. Did you realize that he created us to worship him? But no, we've got to work. We've got a job. We've got to provide for our families. We've got football practice. We've got this. we got that. You know what I'm saying here? We, cut, we clutter our lives with so many things that are so unimportant to God. We clutter our lives so much that we forget about our true purpose, and that was to worship him. So, pastor, what are you saying? We should give up football. We should give up work. I just need to stay at home and worship God 24-7? Absolutely not. Bible says you don't work, you don't eat. I wish the federal government would get a hold of that scripture right there, but they're not going to do it. <laughs> they keep making they keep making these entitlements out here that, that force people not to work. We had a lady in one church that we were at who was working for a particular, just in case she watches this on YouTube, I'm not going to say anything, uh, mention anything. Uh, mention uh, who or where. But she was working at a particular store and, and all of a sudden, but she was getting uh, 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 her, she was receiving a check and, and her check, if she worked too many hours, she wouldn't get that check. And so what she did, she was, if she continued to work, they would pull the check from her. So what did she do? She quit. So she could draw that check. I'm not, I, I, I know I'm, this, this may be something, I may be opening up a can of worms here, but I'm just here to tell you right now, that's not the way God designed it to be. That's becoming lazy. And we don't need to be lazy. Proverbs talks all about a lazy man, a sluggard. We don't want to be that. You want to learn how to not be a sluggard? Read, read Proverbs. Read one every, there's 31 Proverbs. Read, read one proverb a day for 31 days. Mm-hmm. Don't be lazy. Don't be lazy. Work. Provide for your family. But get this. While you're working, honor God with your worship. Worship Him in your job. If you're a Christian business owner, be a Christian business owner. Not just by name. Do what a Christian does. Uh, uh, um, uh, relate to your employees like a Christian. Carry on business. Be a businessman, but also be a Christian. You can do both things. That can live, and the world would be a much better place if everybody operated their business as a Christian rather than robbing and stealing from Caesar and from God. Amen. The Bible says, you know, we got to pay our we, we pay our taxes. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. We know that. You know that, don't you? I mean, I know that there's, I know that there's loopholes or there's, there's, there's deductions. We say loopholes, but really, uh, you know, if, if it's something that, that is established in, in ways, if there's something that is established by the federal government, I mean, and in, in, in it's, it's legal, I mean, that's, that's great. I mean, it's, it's not anything illegal if you're doing something right and it's something they formed. We got to give to God what is God's and give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Pay our taxes. God will honor you. He'll honor you. See, everything, everything we do, that's worship. When we're being obedient to God, when we're being obedient to God in His Word, 
We're worshiping Him. The way we live our life is an act of worship to God. We're not trying to rob anybody or cheat anybody. So you can still be a football player and live your life an act of worship. See, so you're setting your priorities. You can still uh, be a business owner and, and you know, uh, give, give all of your, uh, uh, your you know, spend the time that it needs to, you need to spend to develop your business, but also honor God with your time and honor God with, the, with, your, with your produce, your product. Honor God. It's living our life in worship to Him. Amen. That's the very reason we were created. God made us with a free will so that we can choose to love Him or we can choose to disobey Him. See, it's a choice. Life is a choice. We get up every morning and we make a choice of whether or not we're going to brush our teeth. I hope you make the right choice on that. I hope you made the right choice today. <laughs> We also choose every day whether or not we're going to serve God. Joshua said it really well. Choose you this day whom you're going to serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Man. And you know what? When you make that statement and you say, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. You need to honor God in everything in your home. And don't allow Satan to creep in. Sometimes he creeps in through the weirdest things, in the in the in the and not just weird, but the uh, uh, the most simple things. Sometimes we allow him. Sometimes we allow him big time through our television. Not the TV's bad. It's just the stuff that's on it. Sometimes is bad, and we sit there and watch it. We allow that garbage in our life. We talked this morning in Sunday school, whatever we allow inside of our lives, that's who we become. We are what we eat. And you are what you put in your spirit man. TV's not bad. I remember there's some churches out there used to, buddy, they would, if you had a TV, I, I remember a particular church in Arkansas that they all band together and they wanted to get rid of their TVs and they all got, they grabbed all their TVs and went to a bridge and they dumped them over on the side of the bridge. Now, I'm not sure how spiritual they were being. They were, they were uh, uh, littering and uh, pretty bad and vandalism. I don't, you know, I, I don't know. <laughs> but that was the belief back then that TV was bad. Well, TV's not bad. It's the programming on TV that's bad, okay? And I, I've, I may have made this statement before, but it's kind of like Clorox ble bleach, you, you, you can pour Clorox bleach on whites and it gets them white. It does its job when you use it in the proper way. But if you put it in a glass and you drink it, it's going to kill you. If you, anything you use improperly is going to kill you, okay? It's, it's not going to be good for whatever. So if you use it in the proper way. What we put inside of our lives is who we become. From the abundance of the heart, the mouth is going to speak. We're going to say things. You're going to notice, and I, and I hope through this fast, many of you, some of you may be fasting television. You may be fasting uh, Facebook. I know some are. Uh, some of you, are, uh, I, I, I'm talking about just beyond food, uh, beyond our certain kinds of food. I, I know what we're doing is a partial fast. And so we are still able to eat some things. But I think you'll notice after these 21 days, when you fast certain things, maybe certain things that you used to be so addicted to, you used to think you couldn't live without it. You're going to find out, yes, I can live without it. You're going to find out, I do have more time during the day to spend with God. You're going to find out that that's going to keep you from, listen, I, I, let me give you an example here. We don't have it on our television anymore. And I don't know why I'm picking on television, but uh, it's not that I'm against it. I love it. I've got, I've got a 65-inch, uh, one of those demons in my house. No, no, I'm just joking. Um, but I'm not really picking on television. It's just something good to, to, to do. But we used to have a, a thing called the TV Guardian. <clears throat> and it would, 
you could set the you could set the TV guard and you ran it through your cable and it would pick up the closed captionings on your television and it would cut out all the cuss words. Now you set it on a strict setting and you turn it to TBN and you practically aren't watching anything because anytime they say God or anything like that or Jesus they'll they'll just cut it off. So you you don't need to set it too strict, okay? But uh, but you could set that to a, you set that to a certain setting and we we left it on there. And what it would do, would, when, a, when a closed captioning would come on, or I mean when a, when a uh, cuss word would appear, it would read the closed captionings beforehand. And so it would anticipate it and it would silence the TV, but yet, then it would just put that one sentence where that, where that cuss word or something was at and it would put that up on the screen. We got used to that. And, um, and it would do movies that way, it would do regular television and all that stuff. And so we got used to not listening to cuss words on TV. Well, we took it off. We thought, well, we, I don't know why this thing is hooked up anymore. You know, we don't need that thing. And we took it off and set it aside and, and turned on tele television. And, and uh, we was watching television late night. I think, I don't know if it was a Tonight Show or something came on. And we noticed the first cuss word that it came on. And it was just like, well, I hadn't heard that in a long time. And it just, well, I, I said all that to say this. When you, when you refrain, when you... When you pull yourself away from something, it's amazing how much you change. It's amazing how sensitive you become to those things. We became very sensitive because we didn't hear those words in our house. But once we took that off, and then we, then we started noticing them. See, other, other than that, we would, <clears throat> other than that, we, we if we would have never had that uh, cuss word after we, we could have come on, and we would, we'd have probably never noticed it unless the kids were in there, and we wouldn't want them to hear it. Your mind and your heart become calloused to those things. You got to be careful. You've got to be careful what you allow in your spirit, because your spirit needs to worship God. And you need to worship the Lord with a, with a pure conscience. And it's hard for God to move inside of your life and inside of your church when we're living two lives. Amen. We can't serve two masters. The Bible tells us that. Either you love the one and hate the other. You can't serve two masters. There's one. You can't have two. God made us to worship. David discovers the joy. and satisfaction of spending time with God in worship. He develops a, a habit of playing instruments and singing to God. Even during his youth, while he was alone watching the, watching the flocks as a shepherd he, in, in, in his life, before he received the throne as the king of Israel, and, and even after many ups and downs in the history of, of his faith in God, he always finds himself returning And falling on the hands of God as he discovers the presence of God. See, the presence of God is the best hiding place we can have. It's the safest refuge that we can go to when we're being, when we're being run in, when we're, when we're being attacked by our enemies. There's no wonder he called, they called David a man after God's own heart. You know what? We need to be a church after God's own heart. We need to be men and women of God after God's own heart. We need to direct our families as, as, as parents after God's own heart. Can you imagine the generation after generation will come that will come from our destiny, that will come from our lineage? Uh, if, if, we, if we live in our homes as men and women of God, In our text here, Paul, he, he's telling Timothy that like David, we can always get the spiritual strength that we need through worship. Spending time with God. I think a lot of times we don't take the time in our daily life to just sit back and worship God. This is why quiet time is so important. This is why setting aside five or ten minutes a day 
or however long. At least to just set aside time with God and get inside his word. And then we read, and then, and then, then, then as we're reading his word and we're, and we're being transformed by his, by his word and we're living our life as an act of worship in this world. So, we, we'll grow stronger through worship. That's one of our purposes of this church, is worship. That's one thing that we need to grab a hold of, is worship. Number two is this. We need to have a vision for genuinely caring for our brothers and sisters in fellowship. Fellowship is important. 2 Timothy 1.4 Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. We live in a, we're living in a lonely world and everybody is looking for someone who generally cares about them. A place where they can feel that, they're, that they are needed and, they, and, and that their value matters. They're valued. Yes, the world the world needs a church where its people are, are opening their hands to say what Paul said. He says, I long to see you. You know, fellowship is very important. And I'm not just talking about potlucks. Yes, those are fellowships, but it goes beyond that. It goes beyond just potlucks in, a, in, a, in, a, in, the, in the big room, in the fellowship room here. We fellowship and we build relationships with one another. That's one of the most, one of the most important things that we can do. We build relationships with one another, and we build relationships with God. The, the, there are five unspoken questions before anyone joins a church. Here's this. Number one has to do with acceptance. They say, do I fit here? Do, when, when someone's looking for a church to join, they say, do I fit here? Is this a place where I fit? They also uh, Friendship is another one. Does anyone have interest... To know me? Or are they so secluded in their group? Friends, let me tell you something. We are people of routine. We are. We, we like routine. We don't like things, people in general, we don't like things to change. We really don't. As, as a general, and I'm, I'm, I'm more beyond this church. I'm talking about, and if there's change, we like to know about it. And we like to know how it's going to impact us. And we want to be prepared for it. Here's what happens a lot of times in a church. We build some very strong friendships. And then, but they're so strong and they're so tight. That we don't allow others To hit that, to, to come in. We, we, can't, we can't accept anybody else in it, in that tight group. And we do things together, we, we do this together, do that together. And when somebody new comes along, it's hard for us to pull them in because we don't, we don't want to mess up. We don't want to change our group. In other words, a click. It's hard. People want to feel accepted. They want friendships. They want someone that they can go to. Here's my encouragement to you. Look at your group of friendships, people that you spend time with. Try to include. Do what you can to drop your walls and let some others come in. Pull somebody in. You know, this is where, this is a lot of times in, in a lot of churches, this is where small groups really come in. You know, all, all a small group is, and I've told you this before, is, is just a revamping of Sunday school. It's what it's really become. You see, all, some of these non denominational churches, they, they, they have no interest in Sunday school at all. But yet they'll start, start small groups because they realize the, the value and the impact of getting smaller. And, and developing friendships. And so what they do is they just repackage Sunday school in a different name in a different time, and they call it small groups or cell groups or whatever. 
That's what they do. <clears throat> now, that's got to be controlled from the top down, because if not, then they turn into gossip groups, and that will kill the, kill the church. It will. Absolutely will. This is why the Assemblies of God, it's taken a long time for the Assemblies of God to catch a hold of these small groups because in the beginning back in the 70s or so in the early 80s when small groups were really forming up and cell groups they called them cell groups a lot when they were really forming up all they were they weren't they they weren't overseen by the pastor and, and there was no curriculum they were they were prayer meetings let's go pray I've got some needs today <laughs> and boy don't you <laughs> You spent 50 minutes talking about this need and running everybody 50 minutes. Yeah. And that's what it's become. They, they, became, they, became, they became gossip groups. And it took a while for the, for the assemblies to, to, to catch a hold of that. Man, it's 12 o'clock. <laughs> We've got to grab a hold. We've got to grab a hold of worship inside of our lives and realize that we were created to worship the Lord. And we've got to grab a hold of fellowship and realize that without fellowship, we can't have relationships. I'm almost done here with these, with these two points. Here's another thing that, that unspoken questions that are asked before anyone joins a church. Another one is value. Am I needed? Do they need me here or have they already got it all together? Here's another thing. Benefit. What is the advantage of joining this church? They ask themselves this question. And here's the, the last question they ask. Five unspoken questions before joining a church is expectation. What is required of its members? So what can we do in that sense to make people feel welcome in the church? How can we change who we are? The purpose of the church, we got to answer these questions. There's power in unity, friends. Fellowship. We've got to fellowship with one another so that we can be unified. A house divided, divided is going to fall. I'm going to pause this message this morning. I actually meant to get one more step further before I, before I pause, before I continue this. We're going to continue this tonight. But I'm pausing this, this message right here, right now. I just went over two points. Worship and fellowship are two of the purposes of our church. Friends, we cannot allow the enemy to destroy us from the inside out. We can't. Unity is a key. And that's going to come through our fellowship. It is. It's going, to come, well, it's going to come through a lot of ways, but it's going to really come when we fellowship with one another. And we build relationships and we tear down walls and we allow people to come in and say, and, and if you're going out with a group of friends, this couple over here is hanging out, hey, we, you want to come join us today at so-and-so. Or where, where, whatever restaurant. Or, hey, would you like to sit at our table? As a staff, when we'd have, um, and, uh, actually a lot of times, we'd have fellowships uh, at, at previous churches. Sometimes we would sit down as a family. Sometimes we would divide up. And Rochelle would sit at a table. I would sit at a table. Not that we didn't want to hang out with one another. But we wanted to build relationships with people. And a lot of times if my family sits down at a table, there's no room for somebody else. <laughs> we take up the whole table just about it. 
and maybe one other person. And this is what I like for our staff to do, too, is when we have fellowships, is to, is to split up. Don't sit where you normally sit. Fellowship with one another. I want to encourage you today to pull somebody in, which I know we're fasting. A restaurant may not be a right place for you wanna, today, may not be the right place, but I want to encourage you in the future. If there's something going on, invite somebody that you wouldn't normally invite and, and bring them along. Let's unify together. Let's join together. I want people, when they come into this church, as, as far as fellowship goes, when people walk, through, walk in through that front door, I want them to sense love in this place. Man, y'all are a friendly church. I'll be honest with you, at Marion, we were known, we weren't just a huge church at all. But everybody made the comment, man, y'all are friendly. And I, I just feel, I'm walking this place, I feel at home. And you know something? That's, what, that's the way that it needs to be. People need to walk in this place and feel like they're at home. They need to feel loved and fellowship with one another. Building relationships. That's going to be one of the keys to our success.